The Rise of Totalitarian Islam, Lecture 3. Okay, good morning everybody. We're going to get going. Okay, just to quickly um, summarize where we are. Uh, I stated in the first class that the... Um, I believe that the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood is at the heart, at the core, the, 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 the fountainhead, if you will, of the entire Islamic totalitarian mu movement. The, the origins of, of uh, the violent form of uh, Islamic totalitarians are with the Muslim Brotherhood. We've kind of gone through the history. Um, we're in the 1970s, post Said Qutb, um, and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is, uh, is kind of split, fractured into those who are taking Qud's writing seriously, uh, a more violent streak uh, within the Muslim Brotherhood, to uh, a more moderate view uh, that believes still in the same goal. There's no difference in the goal, but advocates for achieving that goal primarily through political means, primarily through working within the culture, changing people one at a time, and at the same time working through the political process uh, you know, to achieve control over e Egyptian society and ultimately change it with the same vision, Islamic law and Islamic state and so on. But I just want to give you a sense of what this moderate Muslim Brotherhood um, has to say, just to, just to, you can see how moderate they are. Um, in their view, there are four enemies of Islam. This is, uh, you know, again, from the, from the mid-1970s, from one of their major publications. Four enemies of Islam. The Jews, the Crusaders, the Communists, and the Secularists, in that order. Now, this was an article that was written, uh, this, 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 uh, identifying these four is an article that was written for the youth movement. They have a youth movement. They're called Lion Cubs. They're Lion Cubs, you know, like scouts, you know, young uh, kids. And this is what they had to write about Jews in this publication. Brother Muslim Lion Cub. Have you ever wondered why God cursed the Jews in his book after he had earlier preferred them to the rest of the world? His book meaning the Quran. Um, well, by this preference, the original preference, God was testing the children of Israel. And what was the result? God grew weary of their lives. God has heard the words of those who said, quote, God is poor, but we are rich. That's what the Jews said. It may happen that the man lies or falls into error, but for people to build their society on lies, that is the speciality of the children of Israel alone. Such are the Jews, my brother, Muslim lion cub, your enemies and the enemies of God, and such is the truth about them as told in the book of God. Such is their particular nat natural disposition, the corrupt doctrine that is theirs. They have never ceased to conspire against their main enemy, the Muslims. In one of their books, they say, quote, We Jews are the masters of the world. It's corruptors, those who format sedition. It's hangmen, unquote. You know what book that's from? That's the Elders of Zion, right? The, the so-called book that the Nazis used quite effectively. Uh, so it was a book not written by Jews, but uh, as part of a conspiracy theory, as if written by Jews who want to control the world. And this goes on. They do not like you, Muslim lion cub, you who revere God, Islam, and the Prophet Muhammad. Muslim lion cub, annihilate their existence, those who seek to subjugate all humanity so as to force them to serve their satanic designs. Okay. So this is the moderate uh, Muslim brothers. Uh, the Crusades, while not as evil, the Crusaders, i.e. the Christians, in other words, while not as evil as the Jews, uh, still evil. Uh, there's nothing more dangerous, uh, nothing more seditious than the missionaries that are working in Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East. They are the real corruptors trying to corrupt Islam and trying to destroy the Islamic world. Uh, they also have long segments criticizing the Orientalists, that's um, uh, Western scholars studying Islam. Westerners and Christians or Jews can never understand Islam. It's just a way in which to pervert the Muslim world and pervert the perception of the Muslim world. Um, and of course, out of the Crusades come the whole phenomena of, of colonialism. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big um, 
issues in the 70s for these Muslim brothers in Egypt, again, these moderates, were the Copts, uh, C-O-P-T. Uh, Copts are Egyptian Christians. They're not Muslims converted to Christianity. These are Christians that have always been Christians, going back from before Islam, who live in Egypt. So these are Egyptians by ethnicity who, who, who are Christians. And uh, during the 1970s, uh, churches were burnt, uh, cops were murdered, uh, because they were viewed as, in a sense, you know, as crusaders, as this fun element within Egyptian society that had to be, had to be thrown out. In the 70s, communism was a, a big enemy. Um, it was materialism. Uh, you know, it combats Islam because it's atheistic, it's, it's evil. And, of course, they always point out that, oh, by the way, Marx was a Jew. So, surprise, surprise, this has to be an evil ideology. And finally, secularism, which they believe was less powerful than the other three. Secularism primarily in the, these uh, Muslim countries. Undermised the idea of Islam, both religion and state. And the big enemy was secularism. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just mention uh, was Ataturk. Ataturk was the um, man responsible for the secularization of Turkey during the 1920s. Uh, you know, Bin Laden, in many of his speeches, uh, talks, talks about 80 years of humiliation. That the, the Muslim world has been humiliated for 80 years. He is dating it back to the day where the caliphate, the this, the ruler of the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic ruler of the Ottoman Empire, the caliph, who was uh, the spiritual and political leader, was, uh, was eliminated. The caliphate was eliminated by Ataturk in 1924. Right? And, and, and that, to him, is the beginning of the end. Uh, if you will, could, when saying, uh, if we're not, you know, we need a uh, Islamic law, otherwise we're not Muslims, Bin Laden, in a sense, is saying since 1924, we've lived in a state of, of uh, apostates because the caliph is gone, the rule by Islam is gone, um, and therefore we've been humiliated. And Ataturk is the bad guy here because he, he secularized Turkey. He uh, stopped, uh, it used to be Turkey used to use Arabic letters. Uh, he brought in Latin letters. Uh, his whole focus was to turn Turkey to Europe and away from, from the Arab Islamic culture. He actually uh, went through a whole period of, of massacring, killing uh, many of the religious leaders of uh, Turkey in order to try to eradicate Islam uh, from Turkish society. It's illegal in, uh, in, in, uh, in the capital city to wear um, Islamic headdress for women. So you cannot wear a veil. Uh, it's, it's literally against the law. It's certainly against the law in parliament in schools, in public schools. So you know, a lot of this conflict that we're seeing today in Turkey between the Islamists and the secularists are, are as a result of these laws. They, you know, and they're saying, which we would all say, yeah, I mean, they have a right to walk around in any dress that they want, but of course the secularists are protecting against that. Also has a very, the constitution in Turkey is built in such a way that if the military, it says in the constitution, if the military thinks that the government is becoming religious, then the military has a constitutional right to overthrow the government and to ultimately call for new elections. And, and, as, and they have done that at least twice in the last 25 years. Uh, and indeed, the prime minister, the current prime minister in Turkey, when last he was prime minister in the early 90s, was deemed by the military too religious, was kicked out, and new elections were held. He reformulated his party, his political party, to become even more moderate in their Islamist views, and today they're in, the military lets them in, but, you know, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to play it both ways. On the one hand, they want to become part of the European Union. On the other hand, uh, they try to pass a law that would criminalize adultery, which is Sharia law, right? In Sharia, you actually stone the adulterer to death. They just wanted to criminalize it. There was a big uproar in Europe, they said, if basically, if you pass this law, this is the way we're accepting you into the European Union, and they dropped it. But that is the tendency, even in Turkey, even in secular Turkey, the tendency today is towards bringing more and more of Islam, more and more religion in, into the state. So Ataturk is taught, the way these kids are taught, Ataturk is the enemy. Because he 
brought secularism, the separation of church and state, into Islamic culture. And, and he is viewed as, as you know, a, a messenger of Satan. And, you know, like every other evil guy, there are accusations based on probably half-truths, but based on some glimmer of truth that Ataturk um, was a Jew. Um, by some, you know, through his lineage, there's some Jewish blood there somewhere. Uh, it's bizarre, but that's, you know, uh, the Arab world is filled with conspiracy theories. If you're interested in them or in the, um, in the last, in the first issue of, uh, of uh, the Objective Standard, there's an article by Ilan Juno on these conspiracy theories in the Arab world. Okay, so these moderates, right? Uh, what makes the moderate is not their agenda ultimately. What makes the moderates is even not uh, them saying, oh, we shouldn't use violence generally, jihad is a bad thing. What makes the moderates is in Egypt they have come to the conclusion that their best path to power is political. Is political and even and through election. Now, once they get into power, elections will go away and they will say that. Because there is no legislation, there is no legislature under Sharia. But they are participating in the electoral process, and indeed, we'll talk about it tomorrow, there's a huge conflict between the Bin Laden wing, the Al-Qaeda wing of the Islamic totalitarian movement, and even now, and, and the Muslim Brothers in Egypt, and even Hamas now, because the Bin Laden wing believes that even if you achieve power through democracy, it's bad. Even if you can use this tool uh, in order to achieve power, it's bad that the only the violent, only through violent jihad, would power be legitimized. Okay. Even within the Palestinians, for example, Islamic jihad did not participate in the elections. Hamas did, because Islamic jihad believes that it's inappropriate. Another one of these splinter groups uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood. That it would be illegitimate to gain power through elections. Okay, uh, just... Uh, just a, a, a little story in terms of how a uh, could influences some of the th uh, Muslim Brothers thinking. In 1967, we talked about the Six Day War. You remember that in 1948, when there was a war with Palestine, the Muslim Brothers were the first ones to volunteer and go to the front, and were the most passionate of the fighters. Right? In 1967, um, Nasser went to the Muslim Brothers in jail and said, and they remember this is about a year after Kut is hung. And they said, and he said to them, if you will go to the front, if you will fight with the, with the Egyptian military against Israel, we will free you from jail. You can, you can leave. And the Muslim Brotherhood said no. They said the real enemy is the regime in Egypt. Only when Egypt is an Islamic state will we go after Israel. And, and that is Qutb. Right? You are apostates. You, Nasser, are an apostate. You are the real enemy. We will not fight on your side, even against the Jews. Okay. So that's Kut's influence on their thinking. The difference between 1948, where the primary enemy was to kick out the Zionists, the Jews, from, from Israel. Now it's getting the Egyptian regime changed. That is the primary focus. Okay, we're going to leave Egypt. Um, but we're not going to leave the Muslim Brothers. As I mentioned, on a number of occasions, every time there was a, they were oppressed, the Muslim Brothers spread out into the rest of the Middle East. They, they established strong footholds in, in, uh, in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, in Jordan, in Syria, um, and in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And as we'll see, even in Europe, um, and I would argue uh, quite a few footholds even in the United States. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, early on, at least in the 1950s and really you know, through the 1970s, uh, the United States viewed the Muslim Brothers as, um, as a potential positive force in the Middle East. And uh, it's not true that the first time the U.S. helped Islamic totalitarianists, totalitarianism was, was in Afghanistan with bin Laden. It turns out that they were probably supporting Muslim Brotherhood organizations in places like Syria, Jordan, 
uh, less so in Jordan, but Egypt during the 1960s and 70s because they viewed them as anti-communist and in the big coalition. And Nasser, of course, was pro-communist, pro-Soviet Union. The Syrian regime was pro-Soviet Union. And these were elements within these countries that could be supported. And there's evidence, not all these files uh, have been declassified, but there's some evidence to suggest that the CIA was actively giving them money and helping them spread the word as a barrier to communism in the Middle East. Okay. So, and indeed, uh, uh, Hassan Ebala's son-in-law, uh, there's, a, there's a photograph of Hassan Ebala's son-in-law, uh, who, was a, who, was a, who was a big-time Muslim brother, uh, in the White House uh, with Eisenhower in, uh, in 1953 uh, while attending a conference at Princeton on Islam, funded by the U.S. government. Okay, the whole conference was funded by the U.S. government. So uh, Hassan Elbana's brother-in-law uh, goes on to found something called the Islamic Center in Geneva, which, by the way, still exists. Uh, it is still a major source of, um, of funding of Islamic groups uh, throughout Europe. Um, his son, yeah, the, the, the son now runs it. And there were some real issues when the son wanted to come into the United States after September 11th. Uh, and there was, he actually was banned because people, people looked. I think, I can't remember which university invited him, but he was invited to come and speak. And they stopped him from coming because they started reading what the guy was writing and what kind of organizations this center was, was supporting. And again, you see kind of the tentacles going out. And I think, you know, if you get that sense that they're everywhere, it's true, particularly in Europe. Um, this center is a substantial presence in Europe, uh, huge amounts of money, and it is a way of funneling Saudi money into different Islamic organizations throughout Europe and ultimately into the United States as well. And we'll come back to the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States in a little while. Okay, expanded in the Muslim world all over the place. Uh, Quds inspiration, uh, Quds inspires uh, many. The Jordanian military actually at some point trains the Muslim Brotherhood as a counterforce to Yasser Arafat's Palestinians. Uh, in the 1960s, there's a civil war. In 1970, there's a civil war in Jordan, and the Muslim Brotherhood actually fights on the side of the king against the Palestinians. Uh, Palestinians then leave to Lebanon. Um, so they're, they're everywhere. They're supported by the U.S., by Jordan, by... Their most substantial presence, though, is in Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is quite receptive uh, to the whole message of the Muslim Brotherhood because of the Wahhabi, uh, the Wahhabi sect that dominates Saudi Arabia. So we'll step a little bit back into history to talk about the Wahhabis. In the 18th century, Muhammad ibn Saud, Saud, S-A-U-D, was ruler of a small oasis in the desert of Saudi Arabia. In 1744, he entered into an alliance, a sworn alliance, with a radical religious preacher named Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, W-A-H-H-A-B, Wahhab. Marriage occurred between the families to bond them together, which is typical in that culture, and they joined together to establish a, uh, a, a monarchy in the Arabian Peninsula. Wahhab at the time was advocating for a strict following of Islamic law, a strict interpretation of the Quran, and the idea that, which keeps repeating itself, that the problem with, the, with Islam, the decline of the Ottoman Empire and everything was all a consequence of the fact that they weren't good enough Muslims. Uh, you know, but this is a relatively isolated place. 18th century Arabian Peninsula, nobody really cared. Right? Uh, and, and really until very late, nobody really cared until oil was discovered in that Arabian Peninsula. Uh, nobody cared. Um, his inspiration, Wahhabs, was uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, who we've talked about last time, and he believed that both the political and religious authorities of the time were corrupt, and he joined with Saud to establish a Muslim state, uh, and indeed they conquered big chunks of what today is Saudi Arabia, 
established a monarchy, established the rule uh, of, of this religious entity. Between 1774 and 1819, the Sauds and the Wahhabis united, and then through bloody conquest, the lands that Muhammad had originally ruled around Mecca and Medina in the Arabian Peninsula. And this is what will become Saudi Arabia, the state of Saudi Arabia. In 1819, this state was destroyed by the Egyptians at the urging of the Ottoman Empire. They didn't like this entity there that was upsetting things. And then, you know, the Sauds join up with the Wahhabis again in 1824, reestablish a kingdom until 1891, which ends in civil war and the exile of the king. And then finally, in 1902, King Abdul Aziz recaptures Riyadh at the age of 20, relies on the Wahhabi preachers and the Wahhabi sect to mobilize kind of the nomadic tribesmen on his behalf, at which point, um, once he's established control, once he's, he's the king, he has control over them, he suppresses the Wahhabis. He, 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 he reduces their influence dramatically. Uh, and this is, this is uh, typical of Saudi Arabia. They go through this periods in which uh, the Wahhabi preachers, uh, the Wahhabi school, is prominent, influences every aspect of society. As the king feels more confident, he oppresses them, he kicks out the more radicals, uh, loosens things up a little bit, you know, maybe allows women to drive for a few days. Something happens uh, that threatens the king and the royal family, and he brings the Wahhabis back to help him out and uh, reestablishes the more strict Islamic law. And you can see this pattern goes back and forth, uh, you know, throughout the decades, really, and we'll see a few of those. Uh, so think, think of the fact, for example, that today Saudi Arabia, in spite of the way, um, you know, in spite of the, our perception of that country, in spite of how religious that country is, is considered uh, an apostate country by many radical Islamists, like bin Laden. So they're not radical enough. And the Wahhabis don't believe that Saudi Arabia today is a truly Islamic country. You know, for many reasons, one of which the fact that they have so many foreigners living on holy land. This is like, this is the birthplace of Islam. It's holy land. Now, in the 1950s, you've got a very conservative monarchy well, conservative but not radical vision of Islam, really no expansionary goals, no real ambition, no vision, I'd say no ideology. You know, they're religious, very conservative, very static, but they've just discovered oil. So they have lots of money, lots of money. And one of the things they want to do with that money is educate, is build schools, build universities. But they have no teachers. This is a land of nomads. This is a land, uh, relatively, relatively primitive culture. You know? And they have no teachers. Luckily, about the same time, luckily for them, unluckily for us, the Egyptian Muslim brothers are being kicked out of Egypt, or leaving Egypt because they're being persecuted, mid-1950s. Now these are educated people. Middle class, well-educated, from the most Western, the most civilized, if you will, of all the countries in the Middle East, probably Egypt. And they are welcome with open arms. Indeed, a whole university is founded for them. University of Medina is founded for the Muslim Brothers. And they become its faculty. But they become the faculty of the University of Riyadh in all the universities. They become the dominant faculty members at these universities. By 1960, most professors in the kingdom's new universities were Egyptian Muslim brothers. Indeed, Bin Laden, I think I mentioned it, <coughs> Bin Laden studied engineering um, at the university in Jeddah, but he took some theology classes, and his Islamic studies class was taught by none other than a guy named Muhammad Qud, Said Qud's brother.
Abdul Azam. Uh, Abdullah Azam, A-Z-Z-A-M, who would go on to inspire jihad in Afghanistan, would be the central figure in the jihad, the, 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 the whole, all the Arab troops that went to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviets in the 1970s. This is the central figure of that whole movement. Was also a professor in Jeddah. And of course he too was one of bin Laden's teachers. And he came to Jeddah from Jordan, where he was heavily involved in the Muslim Brotherhood, originally in Palestine, because he was a Palestinian, then in Jordan, and then moved to Saudi Arabia. Indeed, I would argue that the whole violent, radical form of jihad, uh, the, um, the, 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 the Al-Qaeda, uh, mentality of suicide bombings, of, of mass murder on, on this enormous scale, is a consequence of the merging of two cultures. It is the merging of the ideology, the intellectualism, if you want, the, the, the commitment to these ideas, an understanding of these ideas of the Egyptians, and of the warrior, nomadic, aggressive Saudi mentality. And I think it is the, comp and, and if you add in the mix money, because that's going to be crucial, the Saudi money, that is what has resulted in the kind of terrorism and the kind of violence that we've seen throughout the Middle East since then. And it started in the 1950s, this merger. It continued through the 1960s and just got more radicalized by this merger of the Wahhabis and the Muslim Brothers. The Wahhabis were non-intellectuals. They believed in basically the same stuff, but they were non-intellectual. It's a very primitive, Saudi Arabia is a very primitive uh, culture, a very primitive state. These are nomadic tribes. They needed the radicalization that the Muslim Brotherhoods provided them. It's that combination that I think is responsible for what we're seeing today. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Any questions? Yes. Um, I, I'm still trying to get a handle on the issue of whether is, is the enemy just radical Islam, or is the enemy Islam as such, given what the moderates have to say? Well, remember, these are the moderate Muslim brothers. Oh, okay, so these are the moderate Muslim brothers. This is not some moderate Islamic professor, at, I don't know, at the University of, uh, of Amman, you know. so. Look, given that Islam, uh, given that the minority today, put it this way, I think the majority of Muslims, particularly in the Middle East, uh, you know, I, I think it's maybe a little different in Southeast Asia, not as different as I'd like, and, and maybe it's different among Muslims in the U.S., certainly, and among some Muslims in Europe. Given the fact that Islam, qua Islam, never went through an enlightenment, uh, and rejected reason so explicitly by, by al-Ghazali in, in the 12th century. Muslims generally are very open to these radical ideas. It doesn't mean they, they endorse them, but they are open to them. So if, when there is a revolution, we'll, we'll talk about Iran, they rally to it. They're going to rally. Are they going to be at the forefront? Are they going to be the vanguard? Millions and millions? No. But they are sympathetic. So... Is everybody agree with, uh, does, does the Muslim world generally, do, you know, we're talking about a billion people. Do they, do they think Bin Laden's right with, with what he's doing? No. I mean, a, a certain significant minority thinks that what he's doing is great. But then there's a huge, and I would argue maybe even a majority, that think his tactics are wrong, but his aims ultimately are right. And that is the enemy. 
So is it a majority? Is it 20%? Is it 40%? Is it 60%? I don't know. But so in that sense, it's Islam because it was never moderated. But I don't want to come out and say that they're not Muslims who practice Islam, who do not believe in Sharia, who do not believe in an Islamic state, who do not, because there are such people. There's certainly Muslims in the United States who are like that. I think a significant proportion, if not an overwhelming majority of Muslims in the U.S. are like that. Uh, and, and at least significant minorities throughout the Arab world are like that. I think they're being radicalized, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. I think things are getting worse, not better. That is, that we're seeing more and more tendencies toward radicalization, and soon enough the whole Muslim world will be our enemy. But, uh, but I'm not, I don't think that's, that's where we are today. Yes? Your own, um, it, is there also a set of, um, it's not in the Quran, but it's kind of the sayings or the practices of yeah. Muhammad. The Sunnah and the Hadith. Right. Yeah. And is, isn't like that the second tenet is the one that talks about jihad? So, you know, I mean, some people, I've, I've been told that you won't find the, the, the term jihad in the Quran, but you will find it in this. Oh, no, there's no question uh, jihad is in the Quran. Uh, it's just a question of how you interpret it. And indeed, Muhammad says there are two types of jihad. There's the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. And the, and the greater jihad is the internal jihad of making yourself virtuous and fighting the temptations of the flesh and the temptations of this world. And the lesser jihad is the violence uh, spreading. Uh, and, and all the scholars will agree with that. Even Bin Laden would say that. But he would say, it's still, a, it's still important. Just because it's a lesser jihad doesn't mean it's not jihad. and doesn't mean it's not crucial. Yeah, last one. Um, you mentioned uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's opposition to Western Orientalist scholars. Yes. Um, I note that a Palestinian scholar by the name of Edward Said wrote one of the most influential books on Western scholarship called yeah. Orientalism. Connection there? Mere coincidence? Well, I find it interesting that he wrote it well after these criticisms were being made by Muslim brothers. So, I, you know, which, which tends, uh, I tend to think he maybe wasn't an orig- original in his uh, criticism. Now, he, of course, presents this in the context of postmodernism. So he brings that whole postmodern analysis to it, which, of course, the Muslim Brothers would reject and, and wasn't. But the, 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 the attacks on Orientalism uh, go way back to, you know, to probably the 30s and the 40s even of these, uh, you know, who are these British scholars coming here to study us? You know, they're the barbarians, we're the cultured ones. So that type of attitude goes way back. Can you repeat the question? Yes, the, I'm sorry. The question was... Uh, Orientalism, there was a very, very uh, significant book uh, written, you know, now I don't remember, I think it was 1980, so in, the, in the early 80s, maybe late 70s, by a, a Columbia University professor named Edward Said, which is incredibly, uh, has been very influential, criticizing from a postmodern perspective the ability of Westerners to interpret the, the East, to interpret the Orient, you know, in particular uh, the Middle East. And he, he was a Palestinian. He died a few years ago. Uh, very, very influential. There's a, there's a wonderful book by, I think, Martin Kramer. Um, it's called something like Shifting Sands. And Ivy Towers in the Sand. Sand Where well, he analyzes how Edward Said's book destroyed, one book destroyed the study, the Middle East studies in all American universities. It's an incredibly powerful book about ideas, about how ideas have an impact in academia and how, in this case, really, really bad ideas, in a matter of a decade, destroy a whole field within academia. It's Martin Kramer. He's at the um, Mideast, uh, with the Mideast Quarterly, um, Mideast Forum, I think, in Philadelphia. But if you want to see the power of ideas... A negative example of that, that it's a really good book. What's the book called? Ivy Towers in the Sand, something like that. And the name is Martin Kramer uh, with a K. Yeah, just, just one last point on these uh, Saudi universities. You remember I talked about this guy, uh, Maududi, the Pakistani guy who influenced Kurd? Uh, he became actually an honorary dean of one of the universities in Saudi Arabia. So they were importing people from everywhere. Uh, and importing the most radical of these ideas um, as part of that. Okay. So we're going to move away uh, from the Muslim Brothers now. 
as you'll see, I believe that there are four pillars. You know, there are four pillars of Islam. I think there are four pillars to the Islamic totalitarian, Islamic totalitarian movement uh, today. You know, the, and, and we've covered two of them, I think. One is the Muslim Brotherhood, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. The second is the combination of Saudi spirit and Saudi money. A lot of it's Saudi money. And the third is the topic we're going to turn to, which is the Iranian Revolution. We'll talk about the fourth tomorrow. And of course, the Iranian Revolution is a lot more powerful also because of money. So the fact that Iran has oil is, is also significant in the, the, the degree of influence Iran ultimately has. But uh, one of the ways in which the Saudis exported this ideology, helped spread it everywhere, is starting from the 50s, 60s, 70s. The Muslim Brothers took control of a lot of these huge charities in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and started spreading money, building madrasas all over the place, building mosques all over the place, and sending their people everywhere, uh, to every major Arab country and Islamic cult country, you see Saudi money flowing in, and you see Muslim brothers, intellectuals coming in. Where, and, and you can trace them all the way to Indonesia, to the Philippines, to Malaysia, to Bangladesh, and on the other side to Morocco, and they played a crucial role in inspiring the Algerian civil war of the 1990s. So, Throughout the Muslim world, There's the combination of Saudi money and, and Muslim Brotherhood ideology has been incredibly powerful. And without that money, the effect would have been a lot less. I mean, they still would have had an effect, but they wouldn't have been able to go out, bring, build the mosques, build the schools, and, and send these you know, supposed intellectuals into, into, into all these countries and have the kind of influence that they have, that that they have had. Okay, so draw a line. We're shifting from the Arab world to the Persian world, to Iran. Uh, and if you want to know the real Persian history, you can talk to John Lewis, because I, I don't know it. Um, I'm going to start with, um, you know, there's always this, um, this notion that and, and it's prevalent among objectivists, and I, I believed it until a few months ago, that here was a country, Iran, that was the most westernized of all Islamic cult countries, uh, where there were, you know, people well-educated, they were western, they were, they were you know, a thriving economy. Uh, it was, uh, and then there was the shock of, of the revolution that went against the grain of the Iranian people. And uh, any day now, because the Iranian people were so westernized, they're going to rise up and overthrow the, the Islamic regime because these western values were so well ingrained in them through the centuries, I guess the centuries before the Iranian revolution. And, and it was just, I, I'd always just taken that as, it, you know, everybody says that, so you know, maybe there's some truth there. It turns out that, in my view at least, that is completely false. If anything, Iran is one of the least westernized, was one of the least westernized of all Middle East countries pre-revolution. I, I actually think the most is Egypt. Um, if you go back to the 19th century, uh, while Britain and France had substantial impact on Egypt, on Syria, on Lebanon, on the, even the Ottoman Empire, had a lot of communication with Europe, was, was continuously engaged. Iran was like somewhat in the middle of nowhere. Nobody really cared. Now the Russians were, were putting pressure on them from the north and at least the, and, and were infiltrating a little bit. And the British worried a little bit by the fact that the Russians were coming in from the north and they had, they had troops, of course, in India and Pakistan, were a little worried that the Russians would come their way exerted some influence on Iran from the south, but overall, Iran was pretty much left alone to maintain a pretty decadent, uh, you know, primitive uh, Islamic culture. There was very little Western influence, very little Western influence, it, certainly any significant 
important Western influence. Uh, on Iran, I mean, if anything, what the, what the British and the Russians try to do is destabilize and try to have a little bit more political influence, a little bit less political influence. But, but there was no culture being brought into Iran during the 19th century, particularly as you compare it to Egypt, which was occupied for much of that period where there was, you know, uh, Aida, the Verdi Opera was performed at the pyramids. Right? The Suez Canal, the, the, the West was heavily involved in what was going on in Egypt during the 19th century. And uh, Egyptians were sending their kids to study in, in, uh, in European universities, the wealthy Egyptians, were sending their kids to study in European universities. You don't see that in Iran. Uh, you see a lot of political unrest. You see a lot of battles. You see very little Western influence. Very decentralized state. A lot of local authority. And a big role played by religious leaders. And this brings us to the key difference between Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims. Okay. After the fourth caliph, way back, you know, just after Muhammad, uh, the new caliph, uh, Ali, uh, was instated. Uh, but his uh, legitimacy, his ability uh, was questioned by a Syrian governor who basically overthrew Ali and established, uh, established his own rule over the Islamic lands, a rule that his family continued for, I think, well over 100 years. Um, and what happened was that that is origin of spit. The loyalists of Ali, those people who believed Ali was the legitimate heir, were the Shiites. So the whole split is political. It's not originally theological. Right? So from the beginning, Shiites believed that they were being ruled by this new ruler who was illegitimate. And that Ali was the rightful, the rightful heir. And that as a consequence, while they couldn't rise up against this new ruler because they were too weak and he was too powerful, they never quite accepted his authority. And indeed, the Shia tradition, really up until the Iranian Revolution, has been, we don't trust the rulers. We, we, we will we'll play along, we'll pretend we're okay with them, but we don't trust them. We don't believe in them. And the real authority, the real guides within Shiite community were the religious leaders. The religious leaders play a much bigger role within the Shiite communities than uh, with the Sunnis. The Sunnis, on the other hand, those who accepted this new ruler, also kind of said, you know, his legitimacy is questionable. You know, he did overthrow Ali by use of force, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. But he won. You know, he's the victor. And the fact that he won probably suggests that Ali was a weak person and probably not the right guy to, to rule over us. So we're going to go with strength. And we're going to be committed to this guy. And we're going to accept his authority. And therefore, the Sunnis are much more oriented towards political leadership. And less reliant on their particular religious community leaders. They're willing to listen to what their political leader, particularly if he has some religious authority, as they did while the caliphate was still around, while you still had this religious leader uh, as part of, for example, the Ottoman Empire. They were willing to tolerate that. The, 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 the Shiites, and they call this quietism, quietism, right? So, you know, they leave politics alone. Politics is corrupt, politics is bad. Indeed, one sect of the Shiites, which is the dominant sect of the Shiites and includes all Shiites in Iran and, and, and uh, most of them in Iraq today, uh, believe uh, at some point one of Ali's, um, Hussein, one of Ali's uh, uh, grandkids, or great, great grandkids, one of it from his line, challenged, re-challenged authority and, and, and tried to establish himself as the leader of the Muslims. And, uh, you know, uh, Kabbalah in Iraq, why that is a holy place uh, for, for the Shiites is because 
He fought. He was going towards Damascus to challenge the authority, and he was ambushed, basically. Uh, and a big battle happened in Kabbalah where he was killed. That's why they have the big mosque there. Uh, and uh, he supposedly had his child with him. And uh, the legend is that while Hussein, which was this heir to Ali, was killed heroically in the big battle of Kabbalah, his child disappeared. And indeed, the Shiites really believe, and if you listen to the president of Iran today, he, he makes reference to this, that this child is still in hiding, waiting to return to his legitimate role as the leader of the Muslims. He is the 12th caliph, the legitimate caliph, and they are waiting for him. And they're quiet in the meantime. In the meantime, they're just hanging around waiting for this political leader, religious leader, to come back and establish his authority over all Muslims. So generally, the real power base, the real power base among Shiites that have been the clergy, and Shiite clergy actually do have some kind of structure. Uh, the, 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 the dominant theological schools uh, were traditionally in Qum, in Iran, and in Najaf, in Iraq. There, there were grades of ayatollahs, how more prominent you were and less prominent you were in the religious hierarchy. Um, while there was no one specific leader up until about the 50s and 60s, there were several, you know, Grand Ayatollahs, for example, the Grand Ayatollah Sistani uh, is uh, no accident. The real political power in Iraq today. You don't hear, you haven't heard about him in the last couple of years. But he's the guy pulling all the strings. He's the guy telling the government who should be prime minister and how to manage it. And, and the Shiites should cooperate with the U.S. right now. But, you know, he's, he's, he's the guy that the politicians go to to ask pilgrimage are made, are made to his. Nobody's seen him in years and years. He, 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 partially because they keep killing each other, these Ayatollahs. Uh, so he, he's, uh, he's in a very secure location. But um, he, for example, will not meet with Americans. He will not meet with Europeans. His intermediaries will meet with Europeans, but he will not, because to him that is, you know, you're scum. I mean, why would he meet with you? Um, so the tradition, again, was not to confront the leaders, rulers directly. Um, everything was through these religious clergy. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Now, uh, during the 20th century, um, the, Shah, the Shah of Iran's father um, established you know, significant military, uh, uh, military experience. Uh, the British helped. The British actually trained him uh, and established his own you know, kingdom, the own line of Shahs. Uh, he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he was the first and tried to bring some westernization uh, to Iran. But, you know, this is, we're talking about the 20s, the 30s, half-heartedly, there wasn't a lot of money. Slowly, oil starts coming in. Uh, they become, you know, the government becomes a little bit more secularized. Uh, they build up a bigger military. Uh, at some point, there's even elections. Um, and you've got a very strong prime minister that the CIA thinks is going to be working with the communists, and, and, uh, and there's strong evidence, I think, that man manages to help the Shah overthrow him in 1953 and reestablish himself. Um, 
The Shah that we're familiar with is uh, that original, uh, from the original line, is, is, is the son uh, who rules uh, from the 1950s through uh, 1979 aggressively tries to westernize, there's no question. I, I mean, brings in, tries to secularize, tries to build up a nationalistic fervor within the Iranians, uh, brings them back to their Persian roots, uh, Persian pride, uh, tries to distance himself from the clergy, tries to minimize their role, uh, obviously brings in Western technology, brings in Western advisors, also is very oppressive. Uh, crushes any kind of resistance, crushes any kind of revolution, you know, any, any religious tendencies. He tries to crush them. He doesn't quite go that to Turk way. Uh, he doesn't go out there and kill all the clergy. He certainly doesn't ban religion. Uh, indeed, he goes through these phases like all these dictators do, you know, where, where they, they, they appease them and then they oppress them and then they appease them, you know, depending on the mood and depending on the swings of public opinion in the population. But generally, I would say that Iran, what the Shah tries to do is give Iran shock therapy of westernization. You know, 20 years of intense westernization into a culture that was very, this was very foreign to it. And indeed, most of that happens in the big cities like Tehran. And most of the Iranian population is just spread out in mountain villages uh, that only after the Islamic Revolution started to get things like water and electricity uh, and so on. Um, so, you know, much of the vast Iranian population never benefits uh, from this, uh, from this uh, uh, tendency. In addition, uh, you know, the Shah opens up markets, uh, big corporations come in, and that some of the people who are most feel threatened by this are the conservative, religious um, tradesmen, uh, people in the bazaars. The, the, the traditional middle class um, uh, traders that are prevalent in all of, you know, if you travel in the Middle East, you, you know, the bazaars are everywhere, the shopkeepers are everywhere. They, they are the, the heart of economic life in most of these countries. Well, the bazaar, the, 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 the shopkeepers, this middle class was very anti-Shah, was very anti-Westernization and viewed it as an economic threat to them and viewed it as a threat to their traditional values, to their you know, family values, their, their Muslim values. And they aligned themselves very early with the clergy and had a very strong relationship with the clergy and funded much of what the clergy tried to do to undercut the regime. And the clergy was trying continuously to reestablish itself as, as an authority and indeed continue to be an authority for, I'd say, you know, 70% of all Iranians. It was a very small class of them, maybe the students at the universities, who were westernized. And even there, what did it mean to be westernized? It primarily meant that you were a communist. That was the ideology that was prevalent on, uh, on uh, uh, universities in, uh, in Tehran in those days. Uh, you were definitely a socialist. Indeed, as we'll see, Khomeini takes advantage of that. You see even clerics. Uh, there's one uh, famous cleric. Uh, his name was uh, Ali Shariati. Uh, trained, uh, got a PhD at the Sorbonne in, uh, in Paris. Uh, uh, trained in Western philosophy. Uh, was actually a student of, uh, of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, in Paris in the, in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, went back uh, to Iran and tried to combine this uh, socialism um, with religion. And was probably, until he died, was probably more popular in, uh, in Iran, certainly among the students, certainly among the intelligentsia than Ayatollah Khomeini was. Um, he, he, he was a, an incredible speaker and really managed to, and was crucial to the revolution, in the sense that he managed to bridge between the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, you know, kind of religious um, orthodoxy and the socialist, secular um, students on campuses. Now, he was killed about two years before the revolution by, uh, everybody says by the Shah, I personally wouldn't be surprised if Khomeini had him, 
had him killed because I think he, he, he definitely viewed him as a threat uh, to the revolution. So, you know, this is the world win. This is a predominantly Muslim country with some real westernization happening in the cities, very fast, kind of shock therapy. A lot of people are upset about this. A lot of people don't like this. There's still enormous amounts of poverty. The bizarre, the middle class is unhappy. Um, and the primary loyalty of the most people is still towards the religious leaders who have a vast network of mosques, a vast network, if you will, of propaganda throughout Iran. They are the people that, people, that the commoners listen to every Friday to their sermons. They are the ones who are engaged with the public on a regular basis. Now, traditionally, again, that wouldn't have mattered because traditionally Shiites are quiet. They don't get involved in politics. They stay out of the way. And what Khomeini's real revolution is, is in changing that attitude of the Shiites, of urging for political power for the clergy, of starting to speak up and not staying quiet. And in that sense, Khomeini was a radical within the Shiite community. I told Khomeini, K-H, K-H-O-M-E-I, N-I, although there are many other <laughs> spellings of this name that I've seen, depending on the books. Was born in 1902. He had a rigorous religious education. He went to all the right seminaries. He was a religious cleric. Note the difference here between him and Bana and Kud and most of the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood leaders who had no rigorous, systematic you know, uh, mainstream religious training. Ayatollah Khomeini was an Ayatollah. He was part of the clergy. Uh, he was trained in Qum, the, the leading uh, theological seminaries. He was well read, as we mentioned last time, in uh, Neoplatonic philosophy. Was well read in, in Western literature. Indeed, he met... Uh, he probably read Kurb, although we can't prove that, but there's just too many similarities between what he wrote after Kurb and what Kurb wrote to suggest that he didn't, but he probably read Kurb. We know that he met Maududi from Pakistan in Mecca in 1963. From the beginning, he, he was a radical. He was a problematic student. Uh, he was very interested in, uh, in mysticism, uh, you know, we, we consider all religion m mystical, but the, even within religion, there are these grades, right? And, and uh, uh, very influenced by Eastern philosophy, uh, Eastern trends within Islam. Um, but from very early on, uh, came to the conclusion that this westernization that the Shah was involved with was something that the clergy could not keep quiet about, that they had to act, that they had to stop this. This was not a regular dictator or ruler that they could just, he's corrupt and they could just ignore him. He was set on destroying Islam and this they could not stay quiet about. As early as 1963, he was involved in, in uh, a, a, a small uprising and indeed was banished to Turkey. So 1963, Khomeini is banished, kicked out, and goes to Turkey, ultimately gets permission to go to Najaf in Iraq, and settles in Najaf, and spends uh, most of his time, until, until he returns to Iran in 79, in Najaf he spends a few months in Paris, just before his return. Um, Paris always seems to fit in here somehow, so it's French. Um, from Najaf... He continues to write. He writes books on politi shared political theory. He writes books about what a state should look like when there is one. Uh, but more importantly, all of his sermons, he preaches regularly, all of his sermons are audio taped, audio taped, and those tapes are smuggled into Iran and are distributed all over the country 
through the system of mosques that the clergy have in Iran. His tapes are widely circulated into the bazaars, into the mosques. Everybody's listening to these tapes. And he becomes a major influence within Iran. At the same time, um, the the Shiites decide that they need uh, a more concentrated authority in the clergy. So they, usually there are a number of people who are considered at the top. And they wanted to have one person at the top rather than a number of people. And there, there were some conflicts with who that would be, but ultimately... Uh, Khomeini becomes that one, in a sense, the spiritual leader of all the Shiites. So this is a real, again, a real clergy. He's in, he's in, the, um, in the system. He's not an outsider. He's not somebody outside criticizing the religious um, authorities or the, the religious establishment. He is the religious establishment. And he uses that fact to get his ideas out there, to get other clergy who might not even be as radical as he is, to get them to help spread these ideas. Yep. He did all this in Iraq in the 60s and 70s. And yep. the, the he was doing this from Iraq, in Iraq, and then spreading it into Iran. Saddam Hussein let it go on. It didn't... Yeah, I mean, well, remember, Saddam Hussein only comes to power in 79... Uh, 68, oh, okay. 69. No, he, he becomes a complete dictator only in 78, 79, because then he goes to war with Iran in 1980. Um, so he's not around. But they, yes, basically the Ba'ath Party, the, 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 the military dictators, before that Iraq had a king, um, king from Saudi Arabia, but a king. Um, you know, they let it go on because it was Iran, because, you know, you don't suppress... The, the religion, because it's, you know, you don't want to upset the, the Shiites, particularly if you're the minority Sunni ruling over them. So you leave them pretty much alone. Um, now, Saddam Hussein got tougher with a lot of the Shiite clergy when they got more aggressive, uh, but then Saddam Hussein ran a much more uh, authoritarian state than his predecessor, too. He was much worse than the people who came before him. Um, Okay, first book uh, that Khomeini wrote was, was a clear attack on secularism. Again, encouraged by the Shah. Um, Khomeini supposedly, you know, go, go figure, but he was a very charismatic person. Uh, his students loved him. He was supposedly a great teacher. Um, and he, his loyalty of his students was amazing. And all these students basically became soldiers in his intellectual revolution. Um, and they stayed in Iran. He, while he was reject, he, well, he had to leave. They stayed in Iran, and they went throughout the whole country, spreading these ideas systematically and building networks. Uh, and they built networks together with the middle class. It, it, it's really crucial this relationship between the clergy and the middle class, because the middle class provided money, provided the financing, but also provided the network into uh, kind of lay society. So he is advocating for these ideas. In the meantime, uh, the Shah is uh, becoming more and more authoritarian through the 1970s, more and more oppressive. He has more and more money, but there's also more and more corruption. His secret police are becoming more brutal. He is becoming less and less popular within Iran. And Khomeini is becoming more and more ambitious. Khomeini actually sees an opportunity here to actually get rid of the Shah. And throughout the 1970s, there's more and more agitation. Uh, Ali Shariati is in Iran advocating for an Islamic socialist state. Uh, social justice uh, becomes a big part of all of uh, actual Khomeini's speeches. This is how Shariati influences Khomeini. Uh, Khomeini suddenly starts talking in the early 70s about social justice uh, in a big way. And social justice meaning, meaning socialism. Um, he establishes connections, really solid connections, with uh, the liberals who want democracy in Iran. Uh, he established solid connections with the socialists and the communists, with the student movement, um, all aligned together to get rid of 
uh, of the Shah. Right? It reminds me of kind of, uh, and I, I don't know the history here accurately, but you know, it reminds me of the pre-Russian uh, you know, pre revolution when the communists for a while aligned with the liberals and everybody else just to get rid of, you know, get rid of the Tsar. And then, of course, we know what happens. The more consistent element wins out. Same thing happens in Iran, and indeed there's no question that they, Shariati at least, certainly knows about how the communist revolution happens. Uh, again, in Iran, they have these cells, five-member cells. They structure it very much like uh, the, the revolutionary structure that Lenin put together. Now, Ayatollah Khomeini, as part of this clergy, as part of this um, establishment, really opposed something that the Sunnis encouraged. He opposed individual interpretation of the Quran. The Sunnis encouraged it, and as a consequence, you get people like bin Laden, who are not trained in religion at all, making fatwas, making statements, making, in a sense, laws based on the Quran, because it's okay for each individual to interpret the Quran. Ayatollah Khomeini says, absolutely not. Look, we are scholars. We study this day and night. We get training. We know this stuff. You guys, you can read the Quran, but you don't get it. You don't get the subtleties. You don't get the nuances. You, you're amateurs. Platonism. Platonism, yes. We are the philosophers. We get it. We see the light. We see the truth. You need to be guided by us. This is very much a platonic attitude. But also one that's consistent generally with somebody who, uh, you know, with, it, with the, you know, it's, I think Catholicism has a similar attitude, right? The Pope knows more about Christianity than all, anybody else because he's the Pope. You know, partially because maybe he talks to God, but mainly because he's studied a lot and, 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 and really this is, this is his life. Well, Khomeini really strongly advocated against personal interpretation. And as a consequence... Shiism, generally, and Khomeini, believe in the need for this structure, for this clergy to exist. Because if you can't interpret the Quran for yourself, you need somebody to do it for you. He believed, therefore, in a strong centralized state. And a strong centralized state in which the clergy ruled. Because they were the philosopher kings. They understood in which they got the authority, he would say, from the people. So it was some form of election. But the supreme leader, the, who has to be a clergy, is uh, you know, chosen once for life. And he's chosen by the other clergy. There is some role, and, and there are elections in Iran for parliament. There is a council of guardians, which oversees parliament. And indeed, there's a president. But they, they are just executors. They, I mean, executors in the sense of executing policy. They, they're executing the laws. They're not, they can legislate within a very narrow band of consistency with Islamic law, with Sharia. So only new things that come about in a, in a, new, in a modern society. But they can't change anything in terms of what is written in Sharia. And everything, they, every law they pass has to get by the Council of Guardians, which are there to protect Islamic law. So the real power in Iran today, for example, is not with this guy whose name I can't pronounce, um, the president of Iran. What's that? No, Rafsanjani is not the president. Rafsanjani I can do. <laughs> I'm mad for jihad. I'm mad for jihad. There you go. Um, who, is, who is the president? Who is a mouthpiece? and quite a mouth he has. Um, the real power in Iran lies with uh, Khamenei, who is the supreme leader. Only the second supreme leader Iran has had. They've had a number of presidents, quite a few presidents. He is the second. He inherited the job from Ayatollah Khomeini. He is the real power in Iran. He gets to ultimately veto any decision parliament or the president makes. And indeed, the so-called reformists, everybody was touting the reformists, who were just a little bit less radical on the, on the spectrum of Islam, but they were reform within an Iranian context. They were considered reformists. Didn't get any of the reform agenda passed. They voted them in parliament. Everybody approved. And then these guys vetoed everything that came by. Uh, indeed, 
uh, 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 the elections are held in a way that the Council of Guardians has to choose the candidates, has to approve the candidates. So only the candidates that are true Muslims, from their perspective, even get to be on the ballot in terms of the elections. I think once that happens, the elections are really free. Right? Everybody goes to poll. They re- I don't think they're rigged once the candidates are prefixed. And indeed, uh, a significant proportion of Iranian population actually votes. Again, indicating that there's no mass uh, revolt against the existing regime. There's no, you know, there's no mass sentiment that's against other than in universities among students. We hear about the students that like the West and don't, and they chafe in the Do they exist or do they just, they're just too, too numerically small? Well, right? first of all, I think they do exist, but they're small. And then they are the moderates, what are called. These are Islamists who are less radical than the existing regime. But look, if they get into power, they're not that much better. They still hate America. Uh, you know, they still advocate for Sharia. They just advocate for a more moderate form of it. Um, the, and, and the not uh, the real, you know, the real pro Westerners as, as, as you know are a very small minority on, on the university campuses. Yeah, John. At this point, I've had some correspondence with some of these secular students of the West Coast who are really opposed to the regime and really want a secular country. They want a socialist country akin to Sweden. Yeah, they're socialists. Well, let me note that they, I think that many of the pro Westerners left Iran. Uh, after 1979 revolution, and what you're getting is when you meet, you know, we meet Iranians all the time in, in, in uh, California because there are many of them, huge community in, um, in Los Angeles and particularly in Beverly Hills. They've done very, very well. Um, and they are westernized, and they are anti the regime, and they are, they are uh, adamant about this, and they have TV stations and radio stations, and they devote significant resources to trying to overthrow the regime. And they will tell you that most of the Iranian population is pro the West. But you have, to say, you have to take what they say with a grain of salt because they clearly have an incentive. They want to motivate Americans to get more active. They want to give us more hope that if we get active, there'll be positive successes. And I think they have a rosy view of Iran, you know, 30 years, or, 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 you know, 30 years after they left or 25 years after they left. Uh, but there's definitely a political agenda, and I definitely think there's a political agenda among many of the American intellectuals who present Iran in a rosy way. Uh, you know, they, they, they want us to, they, they don't want military action, and they want us to help the students, and that'll somehow cause a revolution. I, I, I'm very doubtful that that, would, that, that is true. Um, Khomeini believes that, uh, that uh, in, in this totalism, uh, again, Islam covers everything. He completely agrees with the Muslim brothers on that. And that ultimately, Iran is not the end. That is, that Iran as an Islamic state is the beginning of the establishment of a Muslim empire over, you know, ultimately the whole world. Okay. All Muslim uniting under one regime. I'm not going to go into details of the revolution, but let me just, let me just say this. They, so, you know, they created this broad coalition, riots in the streets in 78. The Shah leaves in 79. Of course, it gets no support from the Americans, so leaves for good in January of 79. Uh, in February 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini returns to Iran from Paris to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in the streets cheering him on. Um, there's a lot of politics that goes on for the next year or so in terms of, uh, you know, shuffling around and manipulation and who's going to rule. But ultimately, until the Khomeini manages to oppress, kick out, some of his opponents leave the country, some of them are slaughtered and killed, uh, and he establishes basically his rule and the rule of the clerics, the rule of the clerics over the country. This is truly a theocracy in the sense of the clerics, the religious establishment, rules the country. He establishes his political vision. Every part of it uh, is, uh, is consistent. The way Iran is is completely consistent with Ayatollah Khomeini's writings from the 60s and 70s. He gets everything that he wants. Uh, is, uh, the first presidents are not to his liking, and he just gets rid of, rid of them. He is the supreme leader. He establishes himself. He, you know, he's voted. Himself. Indeed, there is a vote in 1979. Uh, 
about whether the Iranian people want an Islamic state or not. And the results are something like 93% yes. Right. Now, to what extent that's rigged or not, I have no idea. But the fact that the Iranian people didn't rebel against this notion, didn't rise up against Khomeini if these pro-Westerners were there, if they were a significant force, why is it the Khomeini that managed? I think what happens is you've got an array of Islamists. You've got very moderate, somewhat moderate, somewhat radical, really radical. And when you've got all your options are bad, who's going to win out? The most consistent. The most consistent. And that's what Ayatollah Khomeini was. He was the most consistent. And he was considered the, you know, the clergy, the, you know, the Ayatollah, the authority for all of Shiites. I mean, you couldn't challenge him. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. Our daughter's off to summer camp, and we're worried our network coverage won't reach her. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. Our phones run on the nation's best 4G LTE network. It'll be like she never left. The nation's best network? I feel better already. Now you can focus on how you're spending your summer. Discover the Total Wireless stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in Los Angeles. Refer to the latest terms and conditions of service at TotalWireless.com. Yeah. Did the Sunnis ever, did any of the Sunnis ever accept the authority of the Shiite uh, Khomeini, a uh, clerical authority? Well, we're going to, this my next topic in a sense. No, they never accepted the fact that they would be ruled by a Shiite. However, the Muslim Brotherhood, originally at least, and, and I think many of them still to this day, and, and even within Al Qaeda, as I said, there's this conflict, don't view the conflict between Sunnis and Shia is a big deal. And, and really admire Khomeini and Iran for what happened, for, for the establishment of that state. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's only in Iraq, and, and the, you know, we can talk for a long time about the, you know, what's happening in Iraq and how that's evolved. Only in Iraq have you seen this rise of, 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 this, um, uh, of the kind of uh, sectarian violence, ideological, you know, presented by these radical Sunnis. You don't see that in anything Kurt or, or, or Bana or Maududi or any of these intellectuals wrote. I mean, the Wahhabis don't like the Shiites. Uh, but, but you don't see it, at least in the Egyptian or the, or, or the Pakistani line, you don't see a hatred of Shiism. They're wrong. They, you know, they, you know, the, 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 but they're still Muslims if they're ruled under Islamic law. And indeed, uh, and this is our next topic, um, Iran served as enormous inspiration. Incredible inspiration. Ayatollah Khomeini's victory in 1979 inspired not only Shiites, but the entire radical Islamic movement. And not just radical Muslims, but moderate Muslims who now became radical Muslims because here was an example of success. Ayatollah Khomeini had done it the first time since the Wahhabis and the Sauds, if you will, joined together in the 18th century. For the first time, you got the establishment of, a, of an Islamic state from scratch. Yeah. Uh, what was the part played by Jimmy Carter and the Americans in getting uh, Khomeini into power? Well, I mean, I think that, that the part he played was, A, kind of supporting the Shah. Oh, the question was, what part did Jimmy Carter play in, uh, in uh, getting Khomeini there? I think it was, uh, A... Uh, helping this uh, pretty brutal regime of the Shah and, and uh, originally and, and allowing him to be as brutal as he wanted to be as long as he was a friend of the United States. Then, uh, when Jimmy Carter got into power, uh, suddenly telling uh, the Shah, you got to loosen up, you got to open stuff up, you got to let dissent, you know, we're not going to support you anymore. So went from to the one side all the way to the other, uh, from supporting him and letting him do what he want. Uh, to oppress his people to the point of 
open it up, you have to have more descent. So now he opens it up, and Arturo Khomeini is just ready. He's right there. He's, he's ready to pounce. Uh, and that's 77 to 79. You know, that's, that's Jimmy Carter. Uh, and then, of course, not supporting the Shah when he leaves. Uh, so I don't, think they, I don't think they did anything to literally support Khomeini. Um, but, uh, but they created the environment, both the original support of the Shah and then, the, and then kind of abandoning him that just, just made it possible. And what about the hostage crisis? Are you going to get to that? Well, I was the, I'm trying to move forward. But, uh, you know, because, <laughs> you know, the hostage crisis is um, on November 4th, 1979, uh, the American embassy and uh, all the personnel in the American embassy, 52 people are taking hostage. Uh, they stay hostages, I think it's 444 days, uh, until January of 1981 when Ronald Reagan is sworn in as president. Uh, you know, what does that exemplify? What does that do for the revolution? It basically shows the impotence of the West. It shows the pathetic nature of American power, the fact that we're not willing to stand up, the fact that we're not do, willing to do anything. As, I'm, as Ayn Rand said in a Q&A, the fact that we did not act within days of the hostage taking is a fact that we will pay for for many, many, many years. She said that in, 1979, in 1980, and she's absolutely right, because there's no question that what that message sent to the Muslim world is, you can, you can hurt Americans. You, you can damage America, and America will do nothing. Just stand back and do nothing. Um, you know, one pathetic rescue attempt that, that failed, and that was it. And even that was months later. But nothing immediately. The Iranian Revolution, from the Islamist perspective, is a huge success. Uh, the, they establish a theocracy. They establish Sharia. They dominate the country. They were... Incredibly authoritarian regime. Every aspect of life is controlled by the central government. And it serves as enormous inspiration for the rest of these radical Muslims. Here is an example of success. It works. It can be done. Let's go out and do it. And we'll see that these attempts continue, and they continue to this day. And, and, and an obvious question is, why did it succeed in Iran and, and didn't succeed and does succeed in, in other countries? And, and I think it has to do with what we talked about in terms of the Shiite. The fact that the clergy have such a central role in Iranian life before the revolution. And the fact that the revolution was instigated by the clergy. By the religious authority itself. It wasn't an outside force. So, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the outsiders. And then there's Al-Azhar, which is this theological university which represents the established religious authority. And then there's the political authority. And the Muslim Brotherhood are confronted continuously by religious authority and political authority. If Al-Azhar, if the religious authority went over to the Muslim Brotherhood, I think they would be, they, their likelihood of success would rise dramatically. But that has not happened yet. In Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini was the leader of the religious establishment. And therefore, that was the origin of the revolution. And therefore, everybody in Iran rallied towards it. In Egypt, when the Muslim Brotherhood declares something, the people go, okay, well, what, what's Al-Azhar going to say? Oh, they say the opposite. Okay, now I'm torn. Who do I go with? You know, there's options. In Iran, the clergy, every religious authority spoke with one voice, with Ayatollah Khomeini's voice. There was unanimity. It was from within. The revolution was from within. And I would also argue that Iran was probably more Islamic than Egypt and many of these other countries in sense of the, the people, the masses, the, the middle class, at least as Islamic, if not more. So you had a good foundation with everybody being Muslim, uh, 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 you know, religious, and uh, looking to authority, religious authority, and then the authority, the religious authority, all speaking with one voice against the political establishment. And that, in the Sunni world, on the other hand, that doesn't exist. And as a consequence, almost all the attempts failed. In 1981, during a, a military procession, as a jeep passes uh, in front of the presidential, you know, where the president sits, 
Uh, four soldiers jump out of the Jeep with semi-automatic weapons and start firing towards President Sadat, killing him instantly. Sadat, the pharaoh, is killed. At the same time, a military group takes over a, a, uh, uh, one of the cities on the Nile. And the Muslim brothers, or, or at least this radical fraction of the Muslim brothers, await for the Egyptian people to rise up against the political establishment. Never happens. The uprising is suppressed immediately. Uh, the El Hazar comes out strongly against it. Uh, the political establishment rallies around Mubarak, the new president of Egypt, who still is, who was the vice president under Sadat, so there's, there's a clear line of succession. The, the, uh, the groups responsible for this, again, they round up all the Muslim Brotherhood, thousands of them, El Jihad, which is the specific group responsible for the assassination. The, 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 those responsible are immediately arrested, um, and over the next few years will be tried. And again, you go through this one of these other periods where it seems like the Muslim Brotherhood is going to disappear. But there's never this uprising. There's the people never rally uh, towards this. Again, if you look at El Jihad, again, if you, who, was the, who was the leader? Who was the guy who inspired this assassination? Who was the guy who decided Sadat had to die and this is how we're going to do it and this is the plan? It was an electrical engineer, middle class, well-educated, not from the religious establishment, an electrical engineer who wrote a book very similar to Said Qud, quoting for Qud, quoting from Ibn Taymiyyah that we talked about, quoting from all these scholars and saying, you know, Sadat is the pharaoh, he needs to go, and then creating a group around him to execute on the plan. He and the people who actually do the shooting are hung. Um, massive arrests, as I said, uh, but Mubarak and El Azhar reestablish their control. Uh, one of the things uh, Mubarak decides to do, and again, this is following kind of the Sadat pattern, very quickly releases many of the prisoners, um, talks to El Azhar about how can we Islamize, bring Islam into Egyptian society more slowly, you know, less radically. Uh, and indeed increases the influence of Islamic law in the country, and you're still seeing that. It's like little steps. But in a sense, think about what this is doing to the Muslim brothers and, and, and to the people who believe in the radical agenda. It legitimizes them. It's saying they're right. We just don't want to move that fast. Or we don't want to be that radical. But in essential terms, Islam is the truth. Islam is the law. We just don't want to get there quite that fast. And we... The authority are going to move you there slower. And, and as we'll see, Muslim Brotherhood's political power has grown substantially and, and is quite significant, uh, quite significant today. Um, let, me, um, let me just mention one person, um, just as an aside. Uh, his name is Omar Abdel Rahman, R-A-H-M-A-N. You might be familiar with this name, maybe not. Omar Abdel Rahman was the spiritual leader of al-Jihad, of the group that assassinated Sadat. Uh, he was uh, imprisoned, tried, acquitted, released. He then spent some time in Afghanistan with, uh, you know, fighting in the, in the, uh, in the mid-1980s. Came back to Egypt, continued to rally, was part of the Muslim Brotherhood, continued to rally the more radical elements within the Muslim Brotherhood was again arrested by, Muha by uh, Mubarak, released. Ultimately, he believed that his life was in danger, escaped to Sudan uh, in the late 1980s, which had established Sharia, Islamic law by then. Uh, in Sudan, um, approached uh, members of uh, the CIA who had, he had known from the Afghanistan days, and these were the trainers in Afghanistan, and asked for asylum in the United States. He was uh, indeed granted asylum through these contacts that he had. Uh, he moved to the United States, uh, set up shop at a mosque in New Jersey, uh, was preaching there, and uh, was arrested in uh, late 1993 as part of, uh, as really the inspiration and the chief conspirator behind the first bombing of the world 
Trade Center. These people get around. And today is serving, I think, a life sentence in an American jail, uh, from which just recently, about a year ago, he is still communicating with Muslim brothers around the world, sending fatwas, and indeed his lawyer, who was transmitting these messages, was tried recently for doing that, and I think was found guilty. Uh, she was sending out his fatwas and messages to the Muslim Brotherhood around the world uh, in his name. So see how this network is just everywhere, and, and how it all comes from the same source, the same origins. Yeah, I have like one minute or two minutes. Yeah. Why was he granted asylum? He was granted asylum because, you know, why was he granted asylum by the United States? I, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I think these are pretty cla the classified records still, but the story is that I read, believe it or not, I don't know, uh, is that he had contact with CIA people from his days in Afghanistan and asked for a favor. And they gave it to him. And generally, this is still, uh, you know, the, the, the CIA still did not view the Islamic totalitarianism as the threat. They still viewed them as allies from the Afghan days. Uh, and he was allowed into the United States, as, as were many others. It was Talbot. I can just tell you a story about him. After he was convicted, they were flying by in the helicopter past the World Trade Center. The FBI agent escorting him said, look, it's still standing. And he responded, for now. Yeah. So the, the story is that uh, as he was being transported from jail, so he was in a helicopter and the FBI agent pointed to the World Trade Center and said, look, it's still standing. And he turned around and said, for now. Um, you know, this is a really well-established network. They, you know, they, they know what their agenda is. And it, it, it's, it's really interesting to me that nobody's made the tie or, or very few people have made a tie between the first World Trade Center bombing and, and, uh, and the September 11th bombing and, and the relationship between the two. I don't, think, I don't think it's the same people necessarily planned them, but it's important that that is the primary target, was the primary target of Islamic totalitarianism in the United States for, for two separate units within this larger group. And both of them with origins in the same uh, ideology, both of them came through Afghanistan, uh, both of them with deep, deep roots in the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow morning. This course continues with Lecture 4. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. I need to keep up with my teens this summer without sweating high cell phone bills. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. We have plans to fit all your family's needs starting at just 25 bucks on the nation's best 4G LTE network. I won't miss a thing. Now you can focus on the important stuff, like arguing about curfew. Discover the Total Wireless stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in L.A. Refer to the latest terms and conditions of service at TotalWireless.com. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. 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 See your local AT&T store for details.